David Aurora's classic book, Mushrooms Demystified, is oftentimes referred to as being the Bible of mushroom knowledge. It's a book that graces the bookshelves of expert mycologists and beginning mushroomers alike, and it's an invaluable resource for anyone who wants to dive deeper into the world of fungi. So people often ask, what is that mushroom on the cover? And why did he choose that one? Well, that mushroom is none other than Agaricus Augustus, which goes by the common name, the Prince. And the reason that he put it on the cover, well, that's pretty simple. It's because it's one of the most delicious mushrooms that you'll ever taste. So let's dive into greater detail on this one, and let's learn a little bit more about where we can expect to find it and how we can positively identify it. If this is your first time joining us out here on the Mushroom Trail, welcome aboard. Let's jump in. Let's see what we see. To begin with, it's important to recognize that nearly all of you watching this, whether you realize it or not, are already familiar with Agaricus genus. This is because the most common button mushroom varieties that most of us see all the time at our local grocery stores are in fact also in the Agaricus genus. The common white button mushroom that we know so well is Agaricus bisporus and, believe it or not, the Cremini and Portobello mushrooms are actually the same mushroom. Wait a second, did I just say that all three of those are the same mushroom? Yeah, I did. A lot of times people are really surprised to recognize that the white button mushroom, the Cremini mushroom, and the portobello are all the same mushroom, just in very different states. And to really fully understand this, we've got to go back in time a little bit. So let's zip all the way back to 17th century France, where somewhere along the way, farmers began to recognize that they could grow this tasty button mushroom on compost. And this was a really big deal because prior to this, farmers could actually harvest these mushrooms off of manure found out in grazing pastures. But once they recognized that they could actually transplant the mycelium into a more substantial rich bed of compost, they could get a greater abundance of fruiting of the mushroom, which was a huge advance. But there was an even bigger awakening to come in the mushroom culture in France when people began to recognize that they could actually get a year-round prolific fruiting of these mushrooms through moving these farming operations down into the quarry caves that surrounded Paris and actually crept underneath Paris. The old limestone quarries became the epicenter of a mushroom culture in Paris. And for quite some time, the button mushroom was actually referred to as the Paris mushroom for this reason. So it's worth noting that, you know, a little while ago we were mentioning the fact that all three of these common varieties that we see in the grocery store today are in fact the same mushroom. Now this one that was being seen in Paris in the early days of mushroom farming was the brown button mushroom, which we refer to as the cremini. The white button mushroom was still to come, and in fact, that showed up on the scene in 1925 in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, when a mushroom farmer by the name of Louis Ferdinand Lambert at Keystone Mushroom Farm happened upon a mutant in his patch of mushrooms. So just as was the case with white bread, it was strongly desired to have a white mushroom. So he took it to the lab, did some work on it, and that was the start of what is today the most common grocery store mushroom out there. And in regards to the portobello, it's simply a cremini that's been allowed to reach full maturity. And the flavor profile change can be attributed to the presence of spores. So because it's been able to reach maturity, it's really spored out, and those spores carry a fair amount of flavor. So we can actually use our knowledge of the common button mushroom to clue in to some of the key features or characteristics of the Agaricus genus in general. 
to begin with, they're all going to be saprobic, meaning they're all going to grow from dead or decaying matter. They're also going to have free gills, meaning the gills are not attached to the stipe. The stem oftentimes breaks cleanly from the cap, so a lot of you are probably familiar with that process in the kitchen. You can easily snap that stipe from the cap of the common button mushroom. And this is true for the Agaricus genus. There's also oftentimes a prominent ring or annulus that's left from that partial veil. Similar to the common button, they'll oftentimes be stocky or somewhat robust in their stature. So let's zoom in and take a closer look at the prints in particular. This delicious member of the Agaricus genus is going to really stand out from other mushrooms. They're not exactly mushrooms that are known to hide. For one thing, these can reach a substantial size. In fact, its cap can reach up to 40 centimeters in diameter. That's a huge mushroom. It'll be a light brown color with distinctive golden tones and conspicuous scales. You can see just how much they stand out. It'll also have a partial veil, meaning that in younger buttons, the gills will be covered by the membranous layer that you can see right here. As it becomes more mature, that'll oftentimes drop down into a more prominent kind of skirt or ring that hangs down from the stem or stipe. That's something that we call an annulus. Like other agaricus mushrooms, they'll have free gills, as you can see right here. The gills will start off as an off-white or light pink in youth, and as they mature, they'll turn to a dark chocolate brown color, which is indicative of the spore color. So we're looking for a dark chocolate brown spore print with this one. Sometimes you may notice that the white flesh changes to a yellow color near the outer edge of the cap. You'll also notice that just as was the case with the common button mushroom, the stem of the prints breaks free of the cap. One more feature that really stands out with this mushroom is that the stipe has a shaggy appearance. If you investigate the stipe on younger buttons, you'll see this. And if you're looking at more mature specimens, you'll see that the upper part is smooth and the lower part will have these shaggy scales that you see here. All of these features are really good indicators of the prints, but perhaps the most distinctive characteristic is its scent. This mushroom has a really strong almond odor that's unmistakable. Some people describe it as a bitter almond scent, others will say marzipan, but one thing's for sure, it's a really pleasant aroma, and it's got that characteristic kind of almond undertone. In fact, you know, if I didn't get this almond odor, especially near the base of this one, I wouldn't be convinced that it was the prints. This pleasant almond or kind of anise aroma, especially when it's young, is actually one of the hallmarks of edible agaricus mushrooms in general. When agaricus mushrooms have a bad odor, which is oftentimes described as being phenolic or a creosote odor, that's a good sign of a mushroom that you should probably pass on because there are some toxic agaricus mushrooms out there. Fortunately, here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a lot of edible agaricus species, and the ones that are toxic aren't deadly, so they're not ones that you want to consume. They're what David Aurora would kind of categorize as the lose your lunch bunch, but there, there are a lot of good ones, and they're easy to separate out if you're really paying close attention to the scent that you're detecting with your nose. So that's a really important part of mushroom identification is really using all of your senses and really getting to know these mushrooms on a deep level. And again, that aroma, that is in my mind the key characteristic that I'm always looking for with the prints. If I don't get that aroma, I'm not convinced of the ID. So take a look at these little buttons right here. So we see that those caps are actually dried out. They're a little bit cracked. We'll notice that with agaricus mushrooms in general, they'll never, never have a slimy or kind of viscid cap. It'll always be dry. We notice that shaggy stipe that we referenced earlier right there. So again, very distinctive feature of the prints. And if we look up here, we see another little button popping out. We see that really distinctive kind of 
golden kind of scaled cap or five rolls and yet another button here really cool to be able to find these when they're at this state because again they're going to have a little bit of a different flavor they're going to be sweet and almond flavored whereas the older kind of more mature prince mushrooms will be a little more mushroomy so that flavor profile will change so cool to be able to spot these at this young stage and if we look up here we can see one just pushing out of the ground in fact back here i saw what we call a shrimp so just underneath the surface we can see how the ground's uplifted and look at that another little one but if we're harvesting the prince in this youngest state boy we have to be really really careful take a look just over here so you'll notice this one is a little bit different so these warty spots on the cap are remnants of universal veil this is not an agaricus mushroom look down here this sac or egg-like structure we call a vulva, this is indicative of an amanita. And there are lots of amanitas out there that will kill you. So this is a toxic mushroom to avoid at all costs. You really want to get good at being able to differentiate those. Take a look at this. So if we investigate, we see shaggy stipe. I give it a little bit of a tug no egg-like sac or vulva structure underneath there that's really really key for successfully identifying the prince so boy what a delicious mushroom love collecting these and i've been harvesting from this patch for about two weeks now crazy to see how much these can produce and at a time when we're not necessarily finding a lot of other edible mushrooms west of the Cascades. So this is a spring and summer edible that is choice of choice. And one more thing that you'll notice when you're examining these young buttons of the prince is that they've got a really distinctive shape or stature to them. So we mentioned how agaricus in general are pretty robust and stout. This is oftentimes described as having a marshmallow shape to it and you can see how it's got those kind of almost square edges to it really a pretty young mushroom to look at and uh, similarly over here we can see that same kind of robust or stout nature right this thing has some heft to it and if I clear this thing off here give it a little bit of a tug let's take a look at what's looking like underneath yeah look so partial veil still fully intact on this guy we can see pretty hefty mushroom good size thick and uh, again those squared edges are unique okay let's take a look now at where we can expect to find this one so this is a wild mushroom sure but it's not a very wild wild mushroom and what i mean by that is that you're probably not going to find this one in the most wild places out in remote wilderness areas or you know far from civilization this is a mushroom that people really like but it seems to really like people too it seems to follow us around so this is what i classify as a suburban or even an urban mushroom that tends to show up along roadsides trail sides parks even garden beds and so it's no stranger to humans and that's both good and it's bad it's good in the sense that it's relatively easy to find. It likes, you know, say like uh, park garden beds or beauty bark or growing under hedgerows. All of those things make it very accessible, but it also presents a really unique challenge to those of us that want to forage and consume this. So as is the case with a lot of mushrooms, the prince, Agaricus augustus, is especially prone to accumulating heavy metals so it bioaccumulates a lot of these heavy metals that we obviously want to keep out of our diet things like mercury and cadmium and all kinds of things that really are best left not consumed so this is something that we really want to be mindful of um, aside from getting our identification correct we don't want to just go next to some you know super busy road to harvest this we also want to avoid anything that's near industrial areas right so especially if there's any smelting or metalwork going on near these where these are growing 
best to just admire them and leave them alone. But you can see the undersides here and you can see a full range from like the light guild color to the darker uh, guild color that's indicative of those spores. You know, we referenced the potential confusion with Amanita, so I just want to point out those Amanita mushrooms are white spored and they have white gills through and through from youth into older age. Whereas this one is again a dark chocolate brown colored spore that's really going to stand out as, as being something very different from Amanita's if you give it the opportunity to really kind of reveal itself via spore print or even just a later stage growth. Unlike the common button mushroom, Agaricus bisporus, in the case of the prints, at least to my knowledge, it has never really been successfully cultivated at a commercial scale. Interestingly, Paul Stamets notes in his book Mycelium Running that the prince is actually one of the mushrooms that's sometimes successfully transplanted to new environments by simply planting the butts of the mushroom in home garden beds. So, if you've got space in a garden bed that has a little mulch or beauty bark in it, I think it's definitely worth a try. And I've actually been planting a bunch of these bases all over my home in the hopes that maybe, just maybe, one day, the prince will decide to set up a new colony right outside my back door. So if you've tried this or had any success with it, I'd love to hear about your experience in the comments. Or if you've successfully cultivated this one, let me know. It's such a choice culinary mushroom that to be totally honest, I'm kind of surprised that it doesn't seem that anyone has truly cracked the code just yet. So. We'll see what the future brings, but in the meantime, hope you enjoyed your time out here on the Mushroom Trail. Remember, if you like these videos, take a quick second, hit the like button, subscribe, and stay tuned. Until next time, happy trails.